aperture. Hi, everybody. I see people are still trickling in, but thank you to everyone who's joining us here tonight. My name is Leslie Martin. I'm the creative director here at Aperture. And for those of you who don't know us, um, we are a not-for-profit publisher with the goal of uniting the photography community in print, in person, and online, such as tonight. Um, we've been doing most of these activities since 1952, when we were founded by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for, for photography. And tonight, I'm very excited to have Sarah Swinar and Lucy Gallen to celebrate the launch of Sarah Swinar's new book, Glass Life. And I had the great pleasure of working with Sarah and the designer, Aaron Knudsen, and a team of many others to make this amazing book a reality. Um, what we wanted to do was to create the kind of perfect Sarah Swinar primer. And um, that means bringing together not just um, Sarah's really amazing and complex studio images, but also incredible and thought provoking texts by people like Legacy Russell and Sheila Hetty and an interview with Sarah, with Rose Boutelier, who is the curator at the Remy Modern. And the Remy Modern is currently hosting Source, which is uh, the largest museum project by Sarah Swinar to date. And uh, the Remy Mod Modern helped make this book possible. Um, one of the other elements that makes this book so incredible are the rich textual uh, words by Sarah herself synopses of each of the three films that provide the armature for the book, soft film, rose gold, and red film. Um, and then a woven narrative of the film that has been meticulously footnoted both visually and with a, this vast web of provocative theoretical references, um, internal thoughts by Sarah, all the things that inform her practice. So you're able to sort of get under the skin of the image. And um, those words on all these levels are going to be one of the topics for conversation um, with Lucy and Sarah tonight. So I'm super excited to hear a little bit more about this. And I'll just introduce um, Lucy. Lucy, thank you for joining us. Um, she is the Associate Curator at the Department of Photography at MoMA New York. And since joining MoMA in 2010, Lucy has curated a number of exhibitions, including three of the new photography series. And her most recent exhibitions include projects by Gabrielle Lirondel Hill and Artist Choice by Ita Barada, a raft. Um, Lucy is also co-editor and contributing author of Photography at MoMA, a three-volume history of photography, and her most recent book, Robert Frank Trolley, New Orleans, is part of MoMA's one-on-one -on -one series. Um, also, thank you to Sarah for working with us and for being here. Um, a little bit about Sarah. Sarah graduated with the Bachelor of Design from York University in Toronto. And then after working as a freelance graphic designer uh, for the New York Times, she earned her MFA in photography from Yale. Um, her debut solo museum exhibition, Sarah Swinar Image Model Muse, opened in 2018 at the Minneapolis Institute of Art and then traveled to the Milwaukee Art Museum. Um, Red Film, which is again in the book and is also currently streaming at the MoMA.org website until for just another week for until June 22nd, was also included in the 2018 Sao Paulo Biennial. Um, Sarah has published other independent artist books like the amazing Kitsch Encyclopedia, which makes a very nice matched set to the current Glass Life book. Uh, if you have been fortunate to have both, they sit very well on the shelf side by side. And um, she's represented by Foxy Productions New York, who will be also opening an exhibition of her work this September, Cooper Cole Gallery in Toronto, and The Approach in London. Um, I'll just mention that if you look at the uh, 
link in the chat section, there is a link where you too can bring home a copy of Glass Life for your own library. And if you have any questions, which I hope that you will, please add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them at the end of the evening. So now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Lucy and to Sarah. Thank you all. Hi, <laughs> thanks, Leslie. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm going to tell you a little bit about the structure of what Sarah and I are gonna do with the program tonight. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to Leslie and also to Emily and um, Richard from Aperture and especially to Sarah for this fun opportunity to engage with her, which is always a joy. Um, so yeah, first Sarah's gonna tell you a little bit about the book. So to get you situated with the book itself, which Leslie has done, but she'll you know, get us in there. Um, and then we're going to watch a clip of one of the three films around which the book is organized, soft film. And you'll hear a little bit of the narration along with seeing the images of the film, the language that has been assembled by Sarah, including quotes which are constructed um, out of bits of what Sarah has called regurgitated language, um, she said, and I'm gonna actually quote you, Sarah, from your interview with Rose in the book, where you have said, quote, we are choosing between the same words we've chosen before, the same ways of describing things. You've also talked about this in terms of images too, not just words and language. But what we're going to do um, for our conversation is actually kind of continue that cycle of regurgitation of the same language, um, so to speak. And while doing that, kind of take you into one of the coolest aspects of the book. And we're gonna just restate some of the lines from the films and use them as a starting point to kind of dig in um, and as a basis for our conversation. And there's actually a, another great line in the film Rose Gold, <laughs> the second film where Sarah said, um, or included in the film, I don't really have to talk anymore, <laughs> but we will talk. We're going to regurgitate some lines, but then we're gonna talk about them. So it's going to, I think, be a fun, hopefully organizational device for our conversation, and then also bring you into the book itself. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sarah. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And um, someday I'll find a way to do this more gracefully, but um, here we are. Okay. <laughs> um, is this full screen? Almost. There we go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, this is the book. Um, and the book is as Leslie sort of touched on, um, based around three films, um, soft film, which is the first kind of maybe least widely seen uh, film in this trilogy, which is partly why I'm gonna show an excerpt from it. And then Rose Gold and Red Film. Um, and it has kind of three or four different types of material in it. So these essay pages, like with this essay by Sheila Hetty, one by Legacy Russell and an interview with Rose Boutillier and myself, and then stills, which I'll just kind of run through between some of the quotes that we're gonna talk about. And then um, screenshots from images from, or from the actual films themselves. And um, these pages of text, which is what we'll focus on today. So these are the transcripts from each of the films. And the book is kind of structured around pulling out um, quotes from the transcripts and revealing the research behind them and some of the source material and kind of um, explaining where each line comes from. Um, and I guess part of my project has always been to kind of um, make theory and kind of obtuse um, language more accessible and to like break down all the barriers that um, this type of academic language creates around itself. 
um, I think to make itself seem more important sometimes or because um, the people who write it are speaking to a kind of closed circle or for whatever reason. Um, I'm trying to kind of speak in a more accessible way than a lot of the source material. So the book tries to do that too. Um, and I think before I go any further, I'll show the excerpt from the film so everyone can know what I'm talking about. So this is just one minute of soft film, which is the first film in the trilogy. Soft misogyny. The everyday surrealism of the texture is here right in front of me, but can I convey it to you? How does design what can you do fail? with no time and no money? How do things become a glitch instead of an intention? What is that? Pamplicets? A uh, palimpsest. <laughs> palimpsest. As pamplicets. of objects. The way you can control them. I will only mention a couple other men here. I will steal their thoughts. The information like in my photo pictures carries sits on surface its surface and not within its body. Palimpsets. Look at this beautiful presidential bust. I accept Break everything. Break home under city bench. A soft Example. misogyny. There are these Nike shoes I got. I build them on a website. Then they appear to me in real life six weeks later. Is there a better alchemy than that? But they are pudgier and puffier than they were in the picture. Too plasticky. The wrong shade, like a pair of hands and another set of photographs I found. Who was this man? How did he get that scar on his upper right hand? The eBay boxes often smell like cigarettes when I you open sleep. them. I can't sleep. So I comb eBay. Of course I can't sleep. There was too much to look at. One? Yeah. Faded, An impulse to buy pink. because this object truly is one of a kind. The inalienable object Picasso or a family heirloom. Okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that's the first film. Yeah, start talking about some of these films and these lines that we've heard. And I guess I'll also just say, you know, what Sarah and I have done is, is picked out some lines from first soft film, which we just saw the excerpt from, and then we'll move to rose gold and red film. But I think all of these lines um, will not speak to just the specific films that we're pulling them from, but also wider ideas across Sarah's whole body of work. And then also just to remind you that after we do this and talk for a little bit in this way, we'll open up the conversation with plenty of time to take questions from you all that are joining us. Um, so please do remember, or feel free to put things in the Q&A throughout the whole time that we're talking and then we'll come back to them at the end before we close the program, we'll come to the Q&A. Um, so here we are in the book. This is a page spread of the book. This is the transcript section. And um, maybe we can zoom in to one of the lines. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna read it. Soft misogyny, a line I read on the internet hits me hard. So that's this line from the film. And then you can see the lines going out to some citations and um, you cite here, Sarah, this relatively recent law review article by Justine A. Dunlap, who, and by the way, all of these citations are helpfully listed at the back of the book. But that review article is called Soft Misogyny, the Subtle Perversion of Domestic Violence Reform, quote. And it describes a kind of behavior or belief or action that's harmful to women, harmful, but is undertaken uh, maybe without the perpetrator or without that belief holder being conscious that such harm is taking place. And you also cite here in the citation that Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times called it misogyny without misogynists. So I like to me, it, does, it kind of underscores how these behaviors or these systems can be so commonplace or everyday in our culture that people don't even recognize necessarily that they're perpetuating them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, well. And you also, um, yeah, actually, like when the line is used, you also kind of use this adjective soft and then these soft objects as these visual cues almost to, to strike a chord, I think, with that. Um, adjective in an interesting way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I have many, many of these jewelry boxes and um, 
I mean, it's interesting looking back on the film now, it was sort of such a specifically um, feminist film that was really reacting to the news at the time, also to maybe to being in grad school, which I was when I made this. Um, but I really wanted to talk about these kind of um, very intense topics of misogyny, of kind of structural sexism. I think it's also related to structural racism, the way that um, these things kind of permeate um, our conversations and our ways of acting towards one another outside of our own consciousness. So another example that's in the film is um, kind of asking someone, asking one person about their family pet and the other about their job or, you know, things mm -hmm. that don't on the surface seem insidious. And I wanted to talk about those kind of topics, also Marxism um, and commodity fetishism and all these kind of more um, heady subjects without kind of losing my audience. And some of these things I know are things that are not easy to talk about. Um, in a way that might um, ask someone to pay attention. Um, so I was using these uh, objects as kind of vessels um, to speak about what I wanted to talk about. And I was also thinking about kind of ideas that the way that we value objects can have bearing on the way that we treat each other. Um, and thinking about kind of a lot of theory around um, what are kind of cycles of loving and using and wanting objects and then discarding them, um, what they can say about our culture as a whole. Uh, um, and increasingly now I look at it and I think about it as a sort of allegory for our kind of um, increasingly alienated relationships to one another online yeah. and in kind of <laughs> digital worlds too. Um, but this was made kind of before I was thinking so much about those themes. Yeah. Um, and there are other soft objects in there too. Yeah, vessel is a great word for it. I love the word, of course. All right, so another line that I think we actually heard in that clip also that we might zero in on in the transcript um, goes like this. <laughs> look at this beautiful presidential bust and if you don't mind i'm actually going to read this whole citation here um, as the language is kind of amazing it comes from an ebay listing and it's a certain kind of poetry um and a little bit different from some of the other theory citations that maybe sarah was alluding to uh, vintage avon wild country abe lincoln bust decanter I'm PayPal verified. This is a rare find. More than half full of wild country aftershave in excellent condition. This is a great collector's item and a special find uh, from me by that um, But here you show us through this like example of the eBay marketplace, how value is imparted on something through um, these kind of sometimes arbitrary things like labels, like words, and how the meanings of those words can lose their specificity um, in favor of a kind of value symbol, I think. Um, yeah, and here you've got these great images of, <laughs> of the said presidential busts. I also like, yeah, was interested in the specific figures that you chose and their qualities too, but, or. Well, the, the president's <laughs> They only, yeah. Avon only made a few presents. Oh, yeah. um, the really special ones were gold and the other ones were white. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, the presidential bus and the kind of eBay center of the film is, I guess, a way to speak about um, the changing nature of value and um, how arbitrary it is. Um, and how kind of one thing can mean so much to one person and nothing to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, something I'm like endlessly interested in um, and that eBay really demonstrates like what someone thinks something is worth. Um, and I think like in my work, I've kind of tried to poke at a lot of the colors or signifiers or language that might try to make something seem like more than something that we already have, like a rose gold iPhone, for example, um, or uh, a cologne bottle. 
how it gets kind of designed and um, advertised as something new when it's it's just the same thing over and over again. The film also talks a lot about um, Walter Benjamin, <laughs> um, and Indeed. who I guess will come up later. But um, <laughs> like another one where we everybody is kind of well, I don't think everybody's sick of Walter Benjamin, but I mean it's who not could that be sick of that, Walter Benjamin. Be <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, hopefully but, you all aren't because we're gonna about to talk about him again in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess everyone has their moment where they're like where he really blows their mind and mine was like concurrent to um, looking at all these eBay marketplaces and kind of thinking about, I mean, he said that um, the kind of discarded objects of the recent past have more to say about our effective relationships to things and which by which like our emotional feelings about things and our actual um, emotional lives than any kind of historical document. So I think yeah. these uh, presidential busts continue to have a lot to say in that regard. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, also just like seeing that one was one ninety nine and one was forty nine ninety nine. Um, mm. It seems yeah. like a as good a. Um, <laughs> like indictment of the arbitrariness of maybe once you started buying them sorry you uh, put the price no just kidding um <laughs> but speaking of things that have value to one person and not to another person the next <laughs> quote that i was going to read um might be amusing it goes like this i actually hate this painting here you can zoom in <laughs> um and here you're you're talking about uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon, the 1907 painting by Picasso, which is of course in Mama's collection. Um, and, you know, I was remembering that you have a photograph that uh, earlier photograph, I think earlier, maybe the same year, um, of this painting called Women, yeah. and in which you, inserted your hands into the composition of the photograph and uncovered the woman there. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to just say something briefly about your relationship to this painting as my, yeah. as evident here, yeah. I mean, I guess my use of that line kind of speaks also, I'll go back to, to um, the kind of regurgitation of language to like, um, the structure of language within the films, which are kind of taking language and um, sometimes very storied language like Walter Benjamin or very like revered objects and then kind of using them however I want to or however they work within the context of everything else. So yeah. the line I actually hate this painting maybe isn't even true, but it's just like um, a kind of rejection, I guess, of anything that is this uh, greatly heralded um, and of the kind of, um, I guess, opposite end of value as an Avon presidential bus cologne bottle. And it's pointing again to the idea that um, value is very personal and that eBay is very personal and um, that, you know, we can kind of learn a lot about ourselves and each other by looking at what is deemed important. And then in my own um, Picasso, I'm maybe covering them or pointing to them or um, just making it my own. So this is a painting I have a long relationship with and I kind of both love and hate. <laughs> yes, like so many things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna read just one more line from um, Soft Film. Uh, B already knew that the cult of the new was a false thing to rest on. So we've already talked about B. Here, your B uh, stands for Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, um, the cultural critic, theorist, writer. And like you, you mentioned, he reminds us about how to recognize the revolutionary power and the outmoded and the, the obsolete object or, or um, process that's no longer used rather than this striving for the new or this cult of the new um, as you use in this language here. Um, and then 
later in the film, you also again cite Benjamin's interest in velvety interiors. Um, that's a direct uh, quote, I guess, from, from a, a um, article on Benjamin, but in his scrapbooks for the Arcades Project, um, velvety interiors was one of the things he was looking at. Um, and, you know, that reminded me again about this kind of similar properties in objects and soft film that, that you were looking at that we saw before. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've already touched on Benjamin, so I don't know if you, <laughs> if you had more you wanted to say about him. But. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I, I already declared my love, love for him, but um, I, I think like his idea that novelty is sort of something that's used to dress up um, potentially problematic and damaging social forces as something that we should strive for or um, I mean he was like the first one of the first to question progress narratives and the idea yeah. that um, all of this stuff is going to lead to something so um, and, and, but also the film is not just a critique of those things, it's sort of an appreciation of them. And which I think one of the reasons that Walter Benjamin continues to resonate for so many people is kind of the beauty and personal nature of his writing and the, the fact that he seemed to really love and be seduced by a lot of the things that he found so problematic. So, um, yeah, the film is also sort of about the kind of sadness of um, the way that things fall out of favor. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> like <Yeah>. this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we're in the transcript of uh, Rose Gold. Yes. And I'm going to read a line. Why is mustard 1970s? And then the next line actually goes, melamine was mass produced as colorful dinnerware by a corporation called America Sanimate. So you actually in the in the um, citations here, you talk about these ubiquitous colors of melamine, one of which is mustard, <laughs> yellow, or avocado, and certain earth tones. And then um, I think there's this um, comparison that you have in the film between the substance of melamine or, or um, these objects as a kind of uh, older analog to the place of the rose gold iPhone that is the named <laughs> subject of the film. Is that right? Yeah. Um... I was thinking about melamine, which was kind of mass produced with great optimism in the kind of mid-century period um, under new invented colors like goldenrod and um, harvest gold, for example, um, mm. uh, and then fell out of favor because it actually stained and faded with use and because it, it was actually marketed as an unbreakable plastic and that was supposed to be good like a plastic that would never disappear which obviously <laughs> wouldn't work as a marketing strategy now but I kind of saw the rose gold iPhone as this um, contemporary at the time analog to something like this that was um, as I've already mentioned something you already have that's marketed as something new um, but just using a different color and I was also really interested in the kind of aff affective attachments that I immediately formed to the rose gold iPhone, um, how much I wanted it, even though I knew how it was working on me. And um, yeah, how I could, how, even though we can see how these kind of same forces have worked in the, in the past, it doesn't mean that we're immune to following them for, for them again. And partly that's because there's like pleasure in it. And, um, same with in looking at and collecting these melamine objects of which I have like 500 now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we can see them in some of the stills <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> from the film. Not all of them are mustard. You must have no. an array. I do. <laughs> <of colors. laughs> yeah, and then um, also just the company American Cyanamid like mm -hmm. made, um, well, it's a part of 
Pfizer now, which is interesting. And I mean, I could do a whole talk on melamine. I guess many people probably could. But, um, they were this kind of original American conglomerate that made like fertilizer and designed a suburb and made melamine kind of in not dissimilar to occupying a space that Apple might occupy now. There's also like a reference to the Hoover Dam and these kind of in the film and these kind of like earlier visions of American progress that have now mostly shifted over to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to draw that connection too. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe you'll go through some of these images quickly. Yeah, here they are. <laughs> and then I'll read oh, another. There's some more melamines, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> the melamines, melamine close-ups. They all have these really amazing, um, logos on them. Oh yes, and then at around the same time, I also started photographing flowers that are real colors, but that kind of appear synthetic when we look at them through the lens of everything we've already seen. Um, and um, flowers as they are reproduced in more, even more synthetic um, reproductions, I guess. Like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to read another line. B tells me that optimism is the force that moves you out of yourself and into the world. But now B is someone else. <laughs> so, um, so in soft film, remember B was Walter Benjamin. B here is the cultural theorist Lauren Berlant. And I understand that um, Berlant's book the 2011 book, Cruel Optimism, was a big inspiration for you, for this film in particular. And in your citation here, the longer citation, um, Berlant tells us about, you know, our attachments to objects that she names as inherently optimistic, but there's this cru cruelty to that in that you know, we remain attached to these unachievable fantasies. And so this phrase like object of desire, it's always, there's this, this um, affective property to it that you mentioned of this uh, promise that we hope will become possible. And it remains an optimistic uh, <laughs> feeling for us. Yeah, yeah. when did you, uh, I mean, maybe I know it's been such an inspiration for you, that particular book. So I don't know if you want to touch upon that at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, these pictures are just kind of somewhat have to do with what, what I'm talking about. And um, I won't maybe address them specifically, but um, uh, yeah, cruel, I mean, Cruel Optimism, um, I read around the same time the iPhone came out and I think I'll go back to the spread. Um, and I guess um, it's about how we kind of form attachments to maybe small pleasures like uh, material objects or relationships or um, kind of low grade political change. For example, things that are kind of achievable in the present. Um, in and that that can kind of be a cruel optimism because it holds us back from um, achieving larger scale change or progress or whatever um, you want to call it. Um, and that we get kind of trapped in these relationships of cruel optimism where we um, need these things to keep ourselves kind of thrown into the world and connected to it. We need to keep wanting things and kind of working towards things but um, they can often actually be bad for us. And yeah, that can manifest in many different ways. Um, I guess I was thinking about it in terms of um, images, objects, um, kind of hopes for um, the future that might manifest in commodity advertising. Um, and, but also like the, as I think I touched on this already, but um, Berlant, kind of talks a lot about the pleasure in, in wanting things and the kind of um, double-sided nature of it. So I think it's important that it's not just like an indictment of, right. um, of kind of participating in capitalism, but rather uh, it illustrates the way that 
um, when that's what you have, you work with what you have. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last uh, line that we'll use here uh, is the original iPhone introduced the world to multi-touch. And here the citation is directly from Apple, <laughs> Apple's uh, marketing language. Uh, so the longer citation here includes this smaller quote. The only thing that has changed with this phone is everything. <laughs> 3D touch lets users interact with the iPhone in entirely new and fun ways. Um, yeah, I, I you know, thought maybe we could talk a little bit more about how language is used and um, about this marketing language um, that kind of encourages a certain kind of um, relationship with an object um, or an interaction with an object to use some of their language of this object of desire. Um, yeah. And maybe, you know, that the touch mm -hmm. aspect is something <laughs> in particular, um, you know, multi-touch being a particular named thing, but, you know, I noticed in some of your work, your use of like images of touch, um, again, as a visual cue, it was like, and this seeing of the haptic quality um, as a cue is an interesting thing that you've brought into your own images. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking about like um, Apple's kind of hyper, not to, I'm trying not to say hyper real, but I guess I will, um, images of its objects, like how they're not even photographed objects they're like extremely idealized um representations of them um and um also how apple's advertising language has been kind of very modern modernist in a way like um very much about progress and about like the idea that we're about to reach the best way that things could be and it's going to happen in this time and this corporation is going to make it happen for us um it's kind of, yeah, it, it goes back to the idea that things just kind of repeat themselves. And I guess there's only one way you can really say like, this is the best thing there is. Um, so there's that. And then, yeah, about the touch, I guess it's just kind of thinking about um, how things change and kind of gain history and warp and become, um, much more meaningful after they've been touched by actual people and how nothing will kind of re remain in the form that you see it in, in the ad. Um, but advertising kind of tries to ignore the fact that um, we have bodies and that we touch things and that um, things fade and change. And um, so, yeah, I think the, the Apple language around the iPhone, especially the rose gold one, is very interesting as a kind of um, product of its time that actually relies on a very earlier mode of selling things. Well, yeah, well, so maybe speaking of this kind of <laughs> cycle that you were mentioning, oh, here, here are some more of Sarah's images. And actually, since we're not going to have a chance to talk about all of them, you know, maybe if they come up again and future Q&A. This is one in particular, actually, where you've like overlaid these <laughs> images of holding hands over this cold armor in an interesting way. But maybe we'll come back to it because I want to move on to red film um, while we have time, um, which is the last film in this trilogy that structures the book. And although Sarah is working on another film now, but maybe we'll talk about that later too. Um, so one line that I'll read here that comes back, by the way, over and over in this film, but here it is, a loop, a loop. Um, <laughs> so we've talked, we've talked a lot about how in this film you're referring to this kind of just mir mirage or uh, idea of endless choice about this cycle of capitalism in which we supposedly have access to 
many choices and that's a wonderful thing, but um, really that kind of closed cycle in a way. And in the film, you do this visually um, through allusions to a kind of factory production line cycle and that continuous uh, system in a way. Um, and this citation that you include here at this moment is from the late 60s in which Gregory Bateson describes the systems in our culture that are self-corrective, that are made to preserve the status quo, <laughs> that keep us in this cycle of capitalism. Um, yeah, maybe you wanna talk about that, that motif of the, of the production line and the array of choices that appears in that manner. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there's also like a great Newton quote about the same, that says the same thing as this quote, which is um, essentially that if you leave things running on the same program, they'll just kind of keep, repeat the script and try to maintain themselves and keep themselves going. Um, and yeah, the film is, is, like you said, kind of structured around being caught in these loops um, of choice that aren't really choices or that are choices along the dictates of a, a limited number of options um, that are kind of pre-decided for us, like things to buy or even ways to describe things, in increasingly ways to describe ourselves. Like um, the film also kind of touches on the idea that we kind of reproduce ourselves um, as the personas that we've created for ourselves online um, or out in the world through our own images that we make um, and how it can be very difficult to put your finger on anything in this world or to figure out what's real um, or true. So um, yeah, the, the loop motif actually is back in my new film and continues to feel like um, something that's important and that's connected to a lot of the themes we've been talking about and also to kind of larger notions of truth and of kind of scale and just of how you know what's true or real amid the kind of swirling and ever-changing media landscape that we're in right now and I definitely don't attempt to answer those questions but I'm more trying to kind of recreate how it feels to be within those worlds in, in the hope that um, I guess it might like stir some recognition. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to, oh, here we see some more of the objects on the production line. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to, to read the next line that we have. So I also see that there are some things coming into the Q and A, uh, but this is one of those great lines from the, <laughs> from the narrative. I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king. Um, so yeah, punchy line, but it, it comes um, from the speech made by Queen Elizabeth the I addressing troops. And she's famously claiming that she has the attributes of both the queen and the king at, at once. Um, and it's just, a, it's a memorable line in the film, but you know, I was also thinking about how you've included it in this work that really speaks to the way women are understood or, or present themselves or are meant to present themselves through kind of surface attributes through their face. Face is a line that also comes up again in the film and how you also use your own body in this pretty intense way um, mm -hmm. while delivering lines and hanging upside down at the same time. And this blood is rushing to your face. And um, yeah, this just position of the woman's body in a certain subject. Yeah, I mean, the Queen Elizabeth, I thought the Queen Elizabeth quote is kind of a nice analog actually to the Ellen Pow soft misogyny theme and the idea of kind of, um, her trying to convince um, a group of men that she is worth um, participating amongst them. Or it, it's interesting in that like, it kind of has the same theme in 1588 as in um, 2015, um, which is part of the point, I guess. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, in Red Film, I'm, I do a lot of the script through a kind of male voice proxy, like a kind of male voice of authority. And in all the films, I'm kind of often speaking in my main, in my, my main, my own voice and like connect, correcting or kind of um, checking the male voice actor who's obviously actually speaking my own words. And it's this kind of um, speaking to or against a kind of perceived voice of authority. And then in Red Film, I'm, I'm doing this while I'm hanging upside down and all the blood is rushing to my face and the inside of my body is kind of pressing on the outside and things are becoming more and more physically uncomfortable as the script goes on. Um, and I think it touches on a lot of the themes of the film about our sort of cultural insistence on thinking we can know anything about, out, about the inside of someone by looking at the outside or the idea that um, the inside gets kind of obscured by outside appearance. Um, and, and like I already mentioned how kind of capitalism chooses to ignore that we have actual bodies that will decay and um, that aren't idealized or ideal all the time and that um, kind of exist outside of the images that we mostly see of ourselves in the world. So yeah. Yeah, and actually that's a great lead into the last line that I had wanted to end our little section on, and then we'll turn to the Q&A, um, but which I'll read, which is, but the body is the still center, the constant measure. Um, and this line comes from a citation uh, from poet Susan Stewart's 1984 book On Longing, and which is about the scale of one's own body in relationship to objects, and this idea of the miniature, the gigantic, and, and one's body's uh, scale to that. Um, but in a way, this line, I think, uh, seems to really point to the way you've approached a lot of the, your work, and you just spoke to this a bit, in your films and your photographs, your use of yourself at times, or of a model, um, like in this example here, um in relationship to objects and to images and a kind of situating ourselves within these digital worlds that we inhabit which are also our real worlds that we inhabit <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean susan stewart is one of my favorites um she i guess she talks a, a lot about um, in that book about kind of the miniature versus the gigantic and how um, giant outside forces like bureaucracy, um, the government, advertising, politics kind of swallow us, make us feel small. Um, literally the giant billboards that we see on the street or that we would have seen more in the 80s, I guess. Um, and that the miniature is kind of something that we can control or hold in our hand or have a grasp of and that we kind of um, project the body into the world in order that our own image will, might return to us um, and that we might be able to understand ourselves through the images that we see and how difficult that can be um, and that the only kind of total image or thing that many of us can actually grasp in this way becomes the commodity itself um, because it's kind of impo an impossible task trying to define oneself against the world. Um, and so she's pulling a lot, I mean, that's my interpretation, but she's pulling from psychoanalysis and Marxism and kind of mixing it into this um, text that's really about how we experience images and objects as actual humans in the world, which is a really amazing way to think about it. Yeah, and um, actually, so I'm looking now at the Q&A we have, you know, in these last moments, this last section of the program, I will look at questions here. And so others can add more if they want, but one of them is actually about, you know, we've been using these film transcripts as the structure for our conversation, but some of the images that Sarah has shown here, um are stills from the film but others of them are her photographic work her photographs 
So one question from Jenica is, hi, Sarah, are you more excited about making films now than making photos? Um, <laughs> do you see it as a supplement to the photos or on equal terms? And I'd love to hear about your video and film influences. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we have been kind of just like interchanging uh, formats and obviously in a book, yeah. one, you know, it's interesting how images serve in a book in a different way than they might live in a still or moving way um, in another setting. But maybe um, you want to talk about that. Obviously, you mentioned you're working on a film, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> for just slipping past a lot of the images. I kind of feel like they speak to the themes of the film, but that this would be a seven hour talk if I <laughs> addressed each image. So, um, but I still wanted to show some of them and they're kind of grouped alongside um, the films that they were made with um, for the most part. So the kind of themes that the film um, bled into the images, but I mean, I, love making both and um, I guess to give a honest answer like the kind of temporal potential and narrative potential of film has felt really exciting to me um, and really hard um, so I've been kind of focused on that recently because it feels like um, a vessel for speaking about the way that um, the world feels right now, which feels fast moving and terrifying and um, like something that um, is better for me worked through um, in film. But I also um, feel like I have to make photos <laughs> um, and because I love to make them and because um, I would go crazy if I only made films. So I think like both are just as important for my work. And there's a lot that can be kind of done when you're working with a singular image that can't be done in a video. Um, and it's really hard to make a really good image, <laughs> um, singular image. Like, you know, with a film, you have all this time to work with each image is kind of given less weight or importance. Um, making an individual picture that sort of says what you're trying to say is in some ways much harder, I think. So um, both sides are like very generative and kind of equally challenging in my work. Um, I did want to talk about the armors because this is sort of like an image that does something more simply that I was talking about before, which is kind of the idea of reaching for something that you can't actually get or of kind of touching some sort of unmoving um, figure of authority or representation of something larger than yourself. Um, and yeah, but then there's just all the other things that a photo does, like the kind of um, reflection on the reflection of the photograph of the print and the textures of all the objects. And there's something about kind of being able to stare at these things for a long time that a film can't do. So I guess that wasn't really an answer. <laughs> it totally was. It's a great answer. <laughs> and actually, you know, in a way, another of these questions is somewhat similar. Um, the question is, would you consider this project as art or design? <laughs> and again, like maybe because of my uh, imposing this <laughs> structural well, conceit on our, our way of, of talking, uh, really highlighted the design of the book. Um, yes, which is very so, complex. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, then you, you might want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the book was designed by Erin Knudsen, who's um, a very amazing graphic designer. It was extremely complex to make. Um, like there are systems for each type of quotation um, and each type of image that comes back again. And um, there's kind of an index to the whole thing that I think will kind of reveal itself when um, everyone hopefully can have the book in their hand. But yes. um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I do consider it an art project, the book, um, literally. I mean, that question 
is loaded for me as a graphic designer myself. Um, uh, yeah, and maybe folks don't know that. I don't know if Leslie mentioned that in your bio, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I am a graphic designer or that used to be my full time job. And um, a lot of my work, I think, is informed by thinking about how design works and how um, things get kind of distilled down to an object or an idea or an image that can be then handed over to someone else and understood and how much gets lost in that process, um, which I think is partly the impetus for making this book that bring so much of the material back yeah yeah so the another question that's in the q a um is about you know we were talking when we were starting about um value through words that are on in the ebay marketplace and this question <laughs> is specifically about amazon um obviously at the time that you made you know, a particular film, as you, you mentioned in this conversation, one or another thing might be really at the fore, like the most gold iPhone or using eBay or whatever it might be. And, you know, I don't know if you want to answer this question specifically thinking about Amazon or, or um, generally how you've pointed to these quite specific um, entities <laughs> or things in our culture that have a particular kind of timestamp. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, Amazon, I guess we don't know what the timestamp of <laughs> Amazon will be, but um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't know where you want to go. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Next Amazon wasn't about been, Amazon. No, um, no, I think a lot about Amazon. Obviously, it's a um, very evil corporation. And actually, I think um, if we're like speaking in increments, Apple is less evil than Amazon, for example, because they don't kind of instrumentalize and sell our data, which is, I think, um, the the worst and most egregious offense of Amazon, Google, Facebook, of like the big corporations of our time is kind of taking the surplus value from our activity online and monetizing it without our permission. Um, so my next film is kind of about that, which mm -hmm. does touch on Amazon, although not on the kind of um, marketplace aspect of it which as far as I understand is still not the way that Amazon really makes its money. Um, I think data is the way that, I mean, I know that's how Google makes all their money. And I, I'm pretty sure that um, as, as many exploitative practices as they have to get those packages to our houses, that's not even their, their main, main um, money-making enterprise um so the film i guess is about amazon because it's sort of <laughs> about these like um hidden ways that we're all being used for profit um which is where this title glass life actually comes from is uh shoshana zuboff's the age of surveillance capitalism book um glass life is a term that comes up towards the very end about the kind of um, fragility of our privacy and our ability to um, form our own selves, as I've touched on a lot, and kind of live our own lives amid constant surveillance and um, a kind of constant wave of imagery um, that come from really a few big corporations like Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and to some degree, Apple. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think this is one of the most important issues of our time among many really pressing issues. And um, it's kind of, I guess, a updated version of what soft film, which now feels like, like I always kind of intended for it to, it feels like a time capsule. Same with the rose gold iPhone. Like when I started working with that, part of the point was that it would, would and kind of already did at the time begin to feel obsolete even as I was making the film um yeah. and it, and it has yeah 
Um, so I know we're, we're a couple minutes past eight, but there are a couple of other questions that have come in. Ah, no, people are putting questions. <laughs> it's past eight. Um, well, I saw, yeah, someone um, asked about your process and obviously, oh good, some, I'm being told we can have a little bit more time if people, folks are gonna stay on. Um, <laughs> but someone asked about your process and you know, we obviously, really looked at the way the transcript is um, laid out here and uh, dug into your kind of assemblage thing. Um, they're asking, you know, does the transcript happen after? Like, did you start with a distinct idea or an image or a word? And then, you know, I'm adding on that build from there. Maybe because you um, started talking about your, what you're working on now, I don't know, like, if you want to, <laughs> well, you don't have to answer it by talking about what you're working on now, but yeah. Like what, what the kind of process of starting yeah. a project is? Well, so if you're in mid project, like, <laughs> did you start with an idea or, you know, how does it shape? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess there's always a sort of formative text and or object that starts like the rose gold iPhone at the same time as reading Lauren Berlant or the soft jewelry box at the same time as kind of rediscovering Walter Benjamin or Walter Benjamin being something I read a lot when I was younger and then read a bit again and was like, oh, I finally understand what he was talking about. Um, and in the new film, I think it's the surveillance capitalism book, which um, I highly recommend to everyone. It's terrifying and, and also really beautifully written. Um, and then I guess it was like the surveillance capitalism book paired with the um, experience of being trapped indoors and of looking at my own archive over the last year and of kind of thinking about these like endless archives we're all making of screenshots and saved texts and um, pictures that we've Put, um, actually take with our iPhones and save that we'll never have time to look at again and that um, will just kind of disappear. And um, thinking about my own collection of those sorts of things and about what it feels like to feel a kind of compulsive need to save things that we'll never have a chance to actually address. So the new film kind of takes on this feeling of, um, an archive of like a very sometimes idiosyncratic personal archive and sometimes an archive that speaks to larger things that are happening in the world and kind of works it into one form um, that also is talking about surveillance capitalism and the kind of um, feeling of being watched and of um, remaking yourself as someone who thinks they're being watched. And I don't just mean by like, um, literal surveillance but but watched by others and sort of seen in a way that we didn't feel seen before um but yeah the processing <laughs> which i didn't really answer is just i'll find one one object and maybe one book and then just get like super obsessed with it oops and um start kind of working it into something and i usually have kind of hundreds of pages of text that make it into about eight pages at the end. Yeah, um, yeah. and actually another of these questions in the Q&A is, is about references. I mean, the question is particularly about what other artists that are maybe references for you. Um, and the uh, Isabel, the person asking the question says they're reading Three Lives by Gertrude Stein and the quote, a rose is a rose is a rose, reminded <laughs> her of this as well. But, um, you know, we spoke about a number of the references, literary references, uh, cultural critics, and others that have made it in. Um, I don't know if there were others you wanted to name or throw out at all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like so many, um, I mean, in terms of photographic references, um, I guess Sarah Charlesworth is a big one. Um, um, I think like, um, 
I was actually talking about this a bit yesterday, but uh, the kind of era of photographers like um, Leslie Hewitt or Lucas Blaylock, for example, um, who were kind of just coming out when I was just starting to make photographs, um, who were kind of working on a more, um, not smaller, but like this photo is a good example, like working with a kind of economy of means and um, thinking about what photographs do and how they act on us and how they kind of shape the way that we um, move forward into the world and think about our pasts and our futures and how yeah. they kind of um, shape our our actual um, thinking about what's real even though um, they are nominally not I guess um, those types of artists were um, really important to me, um, just to name a few. I don't know, it's weird how whenever asked that question, you can never think of any of the millions of other artists. Who've been <laughs> I think important. it's great that you're mentioning <laughs> folks that you've been also working alongside because I love that idea of like having a constant exchange and community um, <laughs> among artists. So one doesn't always have yeah. to only mention people that one read about from, you know, couple decades past or many decades past. But um, in fact, it, you know, you're stopping here at this image and, and mentioning Leslie Hewitt and Lucas Blaylock's work um, comes to another question, which is about your techniques of overlapping and, um, you know, they are talking about in this, the films, the overlapping voices, the interruptions of voices on top of one another. But, you know, you've also done that in your photographs and visually in the films as well. Um, and, you know, I'm reminded of the way that <laughs> Leslie and Lucas have done that in different ways of, um, you know, visually showing us how one image has a relationship to an object, um, other images and objects by using either, um, you know, different analog juxtapositions or digital. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, here's an example where you've done that quite clearly with layers of paper <laughs> and tape. Um, and just these ways that um, connections are made, I guess, um, visually in a picture plane between these layers that we see next to one another and on top of one another. Um, I don't know, maybe I talked too much and now you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have something you wanna add about your your use of, of that um, kind of motif or interest in it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in this particular picture, I was sort of thinking about how architectural qualities that are, um, Kind of signify history and value get repeated even in our most unimportant objects like plastic cups that I was finding um, at the store and then um, I'm kind of um, making my own monument in the studio and uh, flattening the whole thing with the reference um, and yeah I guess it kind of goes back to a lot of the earlier themes we talked about, about what is valuable or important, also questions of how the kind of markers of importance in art history or in culture get recycled and, and taken up by commodity advertising, which is something that John Berger talked about a lot, um, to go back to another classic <laughs> reference. Um, and then in the films, the layering kind of initially was something I just discovered while trying to squeeze in as much content as possible, which I guess I'm a maximalist and is kind of, maybe I can go to one of my more maximalist photos, but um, there's one. Um, I like couldn't make these films without kind of imagining that if I didn't like give a new image every time the last one had passed, I would lose the audience. And I still kind of um, feel like it's, me being a product of my time or something where I have a lot of trouble like letting anything breathe or not kind of constantly bringing in a new picture or word or idea and 
um, layering allows for that to happen. <laughs> and also kind of, I think is a reflection of the kind of um, constant bombardment of information that I'm trying to talk about in my work. Yeah. And, and the way that um, the same images repeat themselves in different forms. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've been told to have one last question. So I'm going to try to um, turn us to one of the questions in the Q&A that actually, in a way, is related to this <laughs> question I posed to you uh, when we were talking about red film for the, I'm going to do another plug here, um, <laughs> from MoMA's magazine where red film is currently screening until the 22nd, it's been there available to watch for two weeks. Um, so we're still in the midst of that and folks can watch red film in full there. And, and Sarah and I talked a little bit about it in advance of that. And one of the things I mentioned, uh, you know, you bring in artworks um, to that film visually. Um, this question is more about, um, personally <laughs> squaring one's work with that's critical of late stage capitalism in conjunction with our inability to remove ourselves from being liberal subjects and participating in problematic system, systemic institutions um, you know, of all kinds. And we talked about some of them, but um, you know, we hear like in our, <laughs> this kind of funny, um, way of organizing this talk where I like made us part of the uh, process that you've <laughs> done, which is like repeating the same words and lines. And I was like, okay, let's repeat them again and talk about them again. Um, but just, it, you know, acknowledging that we are um, continually participating in <laughs> certain cycles about um, imparting value to art um, and how art is related to imparting value or um, other systemic um, parts of our lives that we are constantly participating in. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to talk about one's participation in them, but um, I don't know if you have yeah, anything to say there. <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult question. Like, um, if you want your work to be seen and you want um, an audience to hear what what you're trying to talk about versus um, yeah, having to participate in a market and a system that you might feel critical of um, or that is very much complicit in the kind of construction of value that I'm talking about. And I think that's in in the work as much as it can be. And I sort of understand if it doesn't feel like it's enough. And um, yeah, it's an ongoing question for me and I think for every artist. Um, but the kind of visual seduction of the work and the fact that it takes on a lot of the aesthetics of kind of the endless just like endless array of commercial display and of things to choose from um, is trying to kind of speak to the emptiness of it as I've sort of mentioned but also the kind of pleasure in participating and the difficulty of deciding when not to and those are questions I can't answer and that I don't take lightly but um, I don't know. Yeah, we're all stuck in this world that we find ourselves in. And um, I guess it's really difficult to kind of answer um, how to critique it whilst being right at the center. And I, I think other people can kind of talk about that better than I can. I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> um, I think you've, yes, as the questioner Nicholas has put, beautiful answer. Um, you've both visually and through language and um, through all of the sources that you've used pointed that out in your work um, and something that we're constantly grappling with, as you say. Um, so 
I just, yeah, I've reminded you that you can watch Redfilm and you can all use that link that was put in the chat to get your own copy of this amazing book if you don't already have it. And um, Sarah, I think this work that you mentioned, um, folks might have a chance to see it in a couple months, a few months <laughs> in New York <laughs> at your gallery, right? Oh, yes. Well, um, the video I'm making will be at Boxy Production on September 1st. <laughs> um, so in the fall. That'll yeah, be awesome. and the book should be around starting next week, hopefully. So, yeah. Great. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks again to Leslie and Emily and everyone at Aperture and to you all for joining us and having these wonderful thank questions. You. Um, for Sarah, and especially thank you to Sarah for your amazing work. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.